Let's head over to the phones and we'll find State Rep Ron Sandak out of the 81st District taking time out of his morning for us. Ron, good morning to you. Good morning. How you doing this morning? Well, it's kind of a cruddy day out, but other than that, all good. The bill you're sponsoring is, is one that, uh, that our mayor, Rockford Mayor Larry Morrissey, has been talking about for a while. I know he testified what, about a week or so ago uh, for you out of two. This municipal bankruptcy uh, bill. Uh, tell us a little bit more about exactly what you're proposing here. Well, it's, it, it's not really that novel. And here's the interesting thing. Since approximately 1937, the U.S. Bankruptcy Code has possessed and contained a provision, Chapter 9, that would permit municipalities and other local units of government to file for bankruptcy protections under that article if permitted and authorized by the states. Since that time, 24 states, different ways and shapes and forms have permitted their municipalities and other local units of government the opportunity to get Chapter 9 protections. And Chapter 9, this is the important part, fellas, is different than Chapter 7, you know, kind of the late-night TV bankruptcy people, mm -hmm. and Chapter 11 for companies and, and individuals. It is not a liquidating provision. You don't sell your assets and turn the keys of the town over to a creditor. It is a restructuring or, or, or adjustment type of chapter and provision. It gets municipality one avenue, one venue, to kind of restructure their obligations. So for those who think some high roller Warren Buffett could roll in and, hey, city's in tough trouble, I'm going to buy it out from under you and, I don't know, make a factory out of it. You know, everything must go. Town under new management doesn't really work that way. It does not happen at all like that. State Rep. Ron Sandak with us. different. And that's, that's important because much of, the, of the, the debate, much of the reaction has been reactionary based on actually misapprehensions. State Rep. Ron Sandak with us, Riley and Scott on WROK. And it's also not as if if uh, this bill passes and becomes law, you'll see uh, you know, 37 different cities across the state immediately file for, for Chapter 9. This is a, uh, there's a threshold on this that, it, that is fairly high before it would be allowed. Good point. Um, exactly. There has been, I think, something like 60 filings since 1937 in the entirety. So, I mean, there's some, been some conspicuous ones. San Bernardino, mm -hmm. Stockton, California, uh, obviously, Detroit, Michigan. But no, there won't be a run on the bankruptcy court. And yes, there is a huge threshold that's required. It's basically an eligibility threshold from the get-go. The municipality must prove that they're insolvent, that this is the true last measure of resort in order to readjust and fix the financial affairs of the bankrupt entity. Right now, anyone could chap file a Chapter 7, and any company can file an 11. There really isn't that threshold requirement, but that is the case in Chapter 9. So it really isn't a magic bullet. It's not a get-out-of-jail-free. Rather, it's a measure of last resort. And your mayor has been um, a very vocal champion of this concept, but he's been also saying, look, this isn't something me or any mayor wants to do. It's not a badge of honor. Mm -hmm. It's really a badge of desperation and a last measure because there is no other avenue or measure of resolution or relief. And when you looked at uh, some of the other cities, as you mentioned, uh, San Bernardino, Cleveland, and all that, uh, you, you take a page out of their book, but then try to refine exactly how it went down with both of them? Yeah, exactly right. Exactly. And a good point. So there was some, there's always something instructive and, and learned from Stockton, uh, Vallejo, uh, San Bernardino, and yes, Detroit. Some things worked out very well in those instances, and some didn't. So what I proposed after we had our hearing, and I think it was just under two weeks ago, and Mayor Morrissey was a uh, witness at that proceeding, you know, there's a couple things we've learned from those other bankruptcy situations. One, um, we don't want collateral damage to other municipalities and other towns. So the idea that when Michigan filed, other municipalities took a ding on their municipal bond debt. We learned that their credit worthiness was by association nicked a little bit, a basis point. So what we've learned in other instances, other states have given 
um, statutory lien rights to bondholders so that when there is a bankruptcy, God forbid someone has to file, it doesn't hurt anyone else, and those bondholders are given basically a secured creditor status, meaning they're going to be paid. Albeit it may be a longer period of time, they're going to get their money. So that's one instructive lesson. The second one, one, second one was maybe there's a measure of last resort prior to filing, kind of a last chance mediation, if you will. And it's, you know, it's something some other states have, and I'm investigating it. Basically, it's, hey, look, this is really aimed at the collective bargaining units for the public sector unions. Guys, you're pushing this town so hard, they're going to file. So let's bring the parties together one last time and say, do you really want to push this issue this far? Because if so, this municipality may have to afford themselves of Chapter 9 protections. So it's this last chance to negotiate prior to filing, which I think makes sense, and I'm open to that change in my bill. State Rep. Uh, Ron Sandak with us. It's Riley and Scott on WRK, and, and that is the most immediate uh, consequence or the most immediate uh, uh, impact it would have for these municipalities, correct? It's just having the option, the possibility, the specter of the possible Chapter 9 out there, which right now does not exist, uh, theoretically might assist them in trying to shore up whatever financial troubles they have? Precisely. It gains... I mean, look, you ask any mayor, and you certainly have access to Mayor Morrissey, the, the thing that towns feel really helpless about in some instances is the unevening bargaining field given to towns with respect to public sector um, unions, particularly their pensions. Those formulas, those rates, and yes, the sweeteners that have gone on time and time again occur in Springfield. Mayors and local city councils don't have the right to, to, to negotiate over what the pension benefits are. They're just jammed down their throats. Mm -hmm. And every single year, what goes up, their levy goes up in order to pay pension obligations. And so they're, they're always dealing with that. And yet on the other side of the coin, they have collective bargaining units that they're, they're constantly debating and, well, and bargaining with. And now new, you know, new laws in Springfield again. Minimum manning is now a required bargaining concept with the fire department. Mm -hmm. um, and it just handcuffs cities and mayors all the more. Giving Chapter 9 authority would give mayors and city councils this, hey, guys, you're pushing too far. We're not kidding. We're going to lay off, and we may file Chapter 9 because this is an unsustainable financial uh, situation you have us in, and, you know, we're going to have to do this. And that gives, and if they do file, now a bankruptcy judge can rearrange an ongoing collective bargaining contract. They can reopen that contract, and that's something the unions do not want. State Rep. Ron Sandak with us, Riley and Scott on WROK. So there's a difference between, uh, I guess, being truly in need of Chapter 9 and perhaps not having the political will to make the necessary cuts or take the tough stands with negotiations with AFSCME or uh, police and fire contracts. Who makes that ultimate decision about whether it's a, a Chapter 9 situation or a uh, lack of political will situation? Is that a bankruptcy judge? Well, uh, <laughs> question. So... I, I kind of go back to the first proposition, or one of the first propositions when we started this conversation. Trust me, I was the former mayor of Downers Grove. Mm -hmm. Trust me when I say this. No mayor wants to take his or her town, city, village, into bankruptcy. That is hardly a badge of honor, hardly a winning political move. And it's just not something done lightly or with, you know, it's just, you know, hey, let's file today. So, <laughs> right? I'm going to file Chapter 9 today. It's just not done that way. And the sparsity and the infrequency of bankruptcies in other, in, in other states proves that point. There is a body of experience that proves that point almost to a scientific degree of certainty. Here's what I also know. Um, mayors got to get elected, and they're really close to their electorate. Near and dear, local government, there is no hiding space. So the political will to undertake the, the tough decisions are already being undertaken by mayors and city councils. There is no place to wiggle, to hide, to kick the can down the road. No, that's a Springfield thing, guys. I can tell you that un, you know, uncategorically. <laughs> you want to see where, the, where um, delay 
is on you know display regularly. It's been the last few decades in Springfield, and that's why some of the municipalities, including Rockford and other towns, are struggling because they've been handcuffed for so long. So I don't worry about this being an excuse because it's not going to be used with frivolity, but rather really judiciously and really carefully because it's in the nature of the whole concept that we're talking about. It's a, it's a sad state of affairs, though, that, that this sort of thing has to be at the forefront of discussion, too, isn't it? Well, yeah, it is, but let's also make sure we're clear on something. It is. I, it, it, it's not something, this isn't my proudest bill that I bring <laughs> is, hey, look at me, this is what I want to do. I came to Springfield to try to be a problem solver. And in my endeavors to be a problem solver, and because I have a municipal local government background, I'm all too well aware of kind of the handcuffing that's occurred. And here's the thing, guys, going forward, this governor's taking on every disaster, financial disaster that's occurred in the last 20 years, but you know, most pronounced the last 12 years of single party rule that have just caused Illinois to come to a grinding halt financially. That unfortunately means really difficult decisions are so we're double crunching again. We're also we're whacking again cities this time for our own good, and so not so in Indian you know when we reduce the local government distributive fund share, mm -hmm. Rockford to Downers Grove to Carbondale, Harrisburg, wherever that's going to hurt municipal budgets again. Shouldn't we then give them local control and every tool in the toolbox to manage their fiscal affairs? I think yes. State Rep. Ron Sandak with us here for another minute or two. It's Rodley and Scott on WROK. I want to ask about a couple of other topics, too, while we have you. One is a different bill that you have uh, uh, sponsored to eliminate the uh, the five-day-per-week mandate for phys ed classes for K-12 yeah. in Illinois. I wasn't aware we're the only state in the country that has that requirement currently. We were the, the originator. I, now, someone tells me there's two or three other states that have filed suit. I don't know that for a fact, but we are unquestionably an outlier. Let me put it to you this way. Um, it takes two years of social studies to graduate, two years of science to graduate, three years of math, yet four years of PE. I would say our priorities are so backwards it's not even funny. And let me make sure I'm clear on something because I've been accused of being someone that likes obesity and diabetes and other preventable diseases. Well, you just hate gym teachers. That's what it comes down to. Yeah, they, they, that one too. I hate gym teachers. Um, <laughs> I know the difference between physical education and physical activity. Um, the people that know me know I, you know, by and large, I eat right and I try and exercise for a 51-year-old guy. That said, I'm pretty sure schools, teachers, school boards, and yes, parents can determine what academic priorities are best for their local schools. I think STEM education and more science and more math are frankly a little more important from a compulsory education component than PE. That's where I prioritize things. I'm not anti-gym teacher. I'm not anti-PE. I just think locals can decide curriculum better. And, you know, with the, no worries about the obesity thing anyway, what with the First Lady's Lunch Program that everyone loves so much. So, you know, what's the problem? <laughs> uh, and before we let you go, State Rep. Ron Sandak, the, the, the 2015 budget hole has been plugged. And now, of course, we turn attention very soon to 2016 when it's a larger hole. And I guess we'll need, uh, please uh, pardon the analogy, but a, a larger plug. Um, John Cullerton of the state Senate went along with, with the most recent fix, though there were no tax hikes, and, and Senate Leader Cullerton said he wouldn't go along with anything without a promise of future tax hikes. So now as we approach 2016, the governor's been clear. He says no new revenue without reforms first. So taxpayers can be confident that the state will manage the money appropriately now and in the future. Do you think Republicans will hold firm on, on, on that demand, request from the governor, that if we are talking about any kind of tax revenue increases, tax hikes, revenue enhancers, whatever euphemism you like, uh, that they won't happen without those reforms first. I, I do. And I, look, Republicans don't like the idea of any type of revenue enhancement. You choose the euphemism in any way, shape, or form as it is. But the idea that we can finally have structural reform, real, meaningful changes in the shape, the size, the scope, the expense, and expanse of state government holds um, a lot of promise for someone like me. The idea that we can do things fundamentally differently and 
far, with far more accountability and transparency and with some real metrics and analytics. To me, that's exciting. And so, yes, I think the Republicans are going to hold firm. Reforms, 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 and then, and only then, after we've made fundamental change, will we have a discussion on revenues. Because then it's a legitimate discussion. Because then it makes sense, but not before. He's State Rep. Ron Sandak. Ron, as always, we really appreciate you taking time for us. Thanks, fellas. I appreciate it.